Well, all right, an interesting new sound there. All right, inductive reasoning, conjectures, and counterexamples is what the first uh, lesson is going to be about. So, uh, inductive reasoning is uh, just a way of thinking uh, and thinking about what's going to happen next. And <clears throat> conjecture is really just making a statement or a hypothesis about what uh, you think is going to happen next or how do you generate the next term, that sort of idea. And a counterexample, does anybody know what a counterexample is? I don't know a counterargument is. Okay, so what's a counterargument in English? Okay, hold up. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're very much the same thing. It's like the other side of what you're trying to write about. Okay, so uh, a counterexample if counter gets you the other side of thing, a counter example would be an example that goes against what was said. Right? So counter examples are I knew that was gonna happen in the last today. Um counter examples are this is me trying not to get frustrated. Um are examples that disprove a statement is basically what it means. So um, those that had Algebra 2 in the fall, uh, you guys remember when we were doing that closure property? Y'all hated that? <laughs> Y'all remember that? Uh, the closure property was the idea that uh, if you're talking about a set of numbers, so we talked about the, the set of numbers being like the integers. So what kind of numbers are integers? Integers. And zero. <laughs> but what kind of negative positive can you do? Total negative positive zeros out of that. And we talked about the closure property. Uh, and we we talked about, okay, it, are integers closed or addition? Meaning that if I add two integers together, do I always get an integer back? Yes. Yeah, I do. They are closed over addition. But are they closed over division? No. No. And we made up a counterexample for that. So. Division closure would be if I divided two integers, say like negative 12 by negative 4, what do I get back? Positive 3. Positive 3. Is that a counterexample? No. No, because that would work. What would be a counterexample for 3 divided by 6? 3 divided by 6 is 1 half, which is not an integer, but it was a division of two integers. So a counterexample uh, is that idea of something that disproves a statement. So we'll get into those. Uh, in just a little bit so uh guys kind of already have this in your brain you just don't ever call it this all right so let's uh, get a little bit of uh definition here inductive reasoning is making a conclusion based on observations and patterns you do that and it's not coming up there take a deep breath this is how you keep your head from exploding all right I'll try one more time here. If it blows up again. I'm gonna see what I gotta do to get something else to happen here. All right. Okay. So make a conclude a conclusion based on observations and patterns. <laughs> you guys do this every day. Uh, so inductive reasoning is something you use every single day. A conjecture is a conclusion statement. reached using inductive reasoning. Been doing this since you were in elementary school. Uh, these kind of problems come up every year, seems like. Uh, extending a sequence. Uh, so write the next five uh, terms of this sequence, and then we're going to write a conjecture. So 
Finding the numbers is the math part. The conjecture is the reasoning part. So we're going to have to write in words what we're doing to get the next statement so, or next term. They're subtracting seven every time. So the next term would be 10, 3, Okay, so our conjecture could be uh, to generate the next term, subtract 7, just like that, from the previous term. And you don't want to just write out subtract 7. That's not a... Uh, Conjecture. A conjecture is a, you know, full statement. You don't have to use your words as I tell my son. Use your words. Tell me what you're doing. All right. Number two, two, five, eleven, twenty-three. What are they doing? Or what would be the next term? Okay, two times two plus one is five. Five times two plus one is eleven. Eleven times two is 22 plus 1 is 23. So that seems to be working. So the next term would be 47. And then double that. Be 94 plus 1 is 95. Double that's 190 plus 1 is 191. Double that would be 382 plus 1 is 383. Double that would be 600 plus 160, which is 766 plus 1, 767. So to generate the next term, to write it out. Double the previous term and add one. And if you wanted to write the number one there, you could instead of word. I'm not that picky. But do write out a full statement. Don't just say double it plus one. That's not a full statement. So. Please write out a full statement. Just being, trying to be formal here. Uh, number three, <clears throat> maybe a little tougher pattern. I don't know. I don't think it is. I don't think like everybody else. So what's what seems to be the pattern here? What do we know about all those numbers? One, four, nine, four is not all. The next one you would say would be. Okay. That's one way to do it. So that could. Carter? They are perfect square numbers. Both are correct conjectures but a different way of generating the pattern. Both work. So, yes, adding the next odd number would be one way to write your conjecture. Carter said they're all they're the square numbers. So the first square number is 1. The next one's 4. 3 squared is 9. 4 squared is 16. The next one would be 25. 16 plus 9 is... And then the next one would be 36. 49. So you choose which way you write the conjecture. Both of them work. It doesn't matter, but your conjecture just needs to support how you generated your sequence. They're both correct, though. I like the squaring one because it's quick. <coughs> so um, each term is the... Where? Uh, in. Where? In. 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 
it's real formal there. First term is the one squared, second term is two squared, third term is three squared, that sort of idea. <laughs> and if you did the addition one, that's absolutely fine too. Uh, just write it out in a full statement there. So there we see one that's not, uh, doesn't have uh, the same answer for a conjecture, but it still generates the same sequence. That happens and it's okay. All right. Number four. <clears throat> okay, there's letters. This is math class. There's not supposed to be letters. Okay, so we got A and then B, C, and then the next one's D. So we skipped two letters and then E, F, and G, H, I, and J. M is the next term. There's a pattern. It's a little weird. It's different. Okay, so uh, the next term is uh, found by skipping two letters in the alphabet. So I'm going to write it to generate the next term. Skip two letters. previous term. Easy enough. Number five, some time there. Or hopefully you recognize that as time. <clears throat> Is it 15 minutes? 7.30? It's, it's 25 minutes, so 25 minutes from 8.20 <clears throat> would be 8.45, 25 minutes from then would be 9.10. <laughs> yeah. I've come to a uh, realization that a, a good part of the world is not very good at time. Uh, otherwise, people wouldn't be late for everything. I got the last one. That's easy. All right. So, uh, Generate the next term. Add 25 minutes. Important that you say add 25 minutes uh, to that because it's time in hours and minutes there. So be careful of that. That's uh, important. And I guess technically that could be minutes and seconds, whichever way uh, uh, you want to think about that. We thought about hours and minutes, or I did automatically, but it could be minutes and seconds. Previous time. Okay. And number six. Nine, all right, so I've got three, one, four, one, five. Uh oh. <clears throat> think, think bigger than that. that technically that's the pattern that's showing up here but Think about a fairly important number that has a special symbol. ND is an important number. Uh, I need it a lot for your degree. Uh, but um, pi, okay, well, pi, what's important about pi? Yeah, it really is that. If you explained it well, no. <laughs> five, nine, two, six, five, three. Did y'all do the thing where he had you uh, memorize digits? Uh, 
You got a hundred digits? No, that's just oh. how many I got the most. So I got the most oh, number. okay. Jeez. That seems a little much. All right, so each term is a digit of pi. No, you don't have to. Uh, not on every one of them. <coughs> I won't be too picky, but don't just write, you know, a, a math statement. Write a few words in there at least, Carson. That's a good question, though. All right, so that's that's kind of the idea. If I were going to ask you that on like a quiz or something, I'd probably go a couple of more digits just so you knew. Hey, that's not three one four one five one six one. That sort of idea that you would see a change happening there. Uh, so if I were going to use that on a quiz, I definitely would uh, pick a, a little bit more of the sequence anyway. All right, so let's get into counterexamples. Uh, so a counterexample, uh, we talked about that earlier. It's an example that shows, yeah, a conjecture or statement. So our conjectures or statements is false. <laughs> so we're going to be looking at some uh, some conjectures and deciding are they true or false. If they're false, we're going to write a counterexample for that. So uh, number one says the sum of any two consecutive integers is always odd. True. true? Okay. Yeah. Because if you add the integers together, uh, you know, I take the special case like zero plus one. That's odd. Uh, one plus two is three. That's odd, and that carries on forever there. So, uh, definitely true. First one is true. Number two, true as a unit. All right. Um, product of two numbers is always larger than either number. The product of two numbers. So, somebody that said false, give me a counterexample. Okay, negative 1 times 11 is negative 11. The product, the answer, uh, negative 11 is smaller than both of those. Negative numbers. There's a counterexample, so this definitely is false. Uh, what would be another counterexample? That's not the only one, obviously. Okay, one times two is equal to two, not larger. Uh, what about three times uh, a third? One. one, and one's not larger than three. It's larger than either number. That means, is it larger than the first number? But it, Okay, but it's got to be larger than either of those two for, to make that a true statement. Yes. I am saying uh, larger than either of those, that means you've got to be able to compare it to both numbers and it be larger, uh, which is false. A false thing there. Uh, three, the product of two perfect squares is always a perfect square. What are perfect squares? Okay. 36, 4, 9, 16, all of those are perfect square numbers. If you multiply two perfect square numbers times each other, do you always get a square number back? Yeah. Yes. This is true. Take, for example, if I take x squared times y squared, that's x squared y squared, which can be written with exponent rules like that that's kind of the proof that that's true anyway not a, no counter example of that that works uh number four area of a rectangle is six square meters then the dimensions must be two meters by three meters oh. why yeah okay so one meter by six meters 
there's a counterexample for that. There are an infinite number of counterexamples for that. You could use decimals in that because there's no rule that says it has to measure out to be perfectly one, you know, on the meter mark. Uh, number five, dividing by two always produces a number less than the original number. Boss, anytime you see words like always, that's a... Uh, <laughs> That's always a clue to tell you. I, I need to be really looking for some of the counterexamples here. So give me a counterexample. Negative 32 divided by 2. Negative 16, which is uh, larger than negative 32. So there's a good example. <coughs> Number six, vertical angles are never complementary angles. What do we know about vertical angles from unit one? That the angles in one angle. No. They have the same measure. Okay. So what do we know about complementary angles? From unit? They have to be 90 degrees. So are there ever any two angles that have the same measure that could add to be 90 degrees? That could be both of them 45 degrees, right? So this would definitely be false. Both angles, 45 degrees, 45 plus 45 equals 90. There's a counterexample. Number seven, if A times B is equal to zero, then either A equals zero or B equals zero. That's the zero product property, uh, is what that statement is. Now we use that in algebra one and algebra two. We do factory. That's the whole premise of setting it equal to zero and factoring. What that's from. Number eight, two angles supplementary to the same angle must be congruent. Well, uh, give me a counterexample. False. What's it mean to be supplementary? They go 180. <laughs> so, um, does that mean they have to be together? Like adjacent to each other? No, it doesn't necessarily have to be that. But if two angles are supplementary to the same angle, those other two angles must be congruent. It's one Doesn't necessarily mean that they're perfectly congruent. Yeah. So whatever the angle they're supplementary to is, its value doesn't change. So it's still got to add up to be 180. So if angle the third angle is 15, then we know that the other two both are 165 out of that. So this is a true statement. You got to think about definitions. Definitions are a very important part of uh, geometry. So don't forget stuff that we talk about. Number nine. Uh, all state names have at least two syllables. I'm going to say false. Give me a state that doesn't have two syllables. Alaska. Well, it doesn't have at least two syllables. So it can have more than two. You need one syllable. Oh, we're gonna do a lesson. I'm gonna be an English teacher here. Oh, hi. Oh, my God. Oh, wow. 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 <laughs> I'm going to talk to Coach Austin and the English department. Uh, number 10, squaring a number and adding one will always produce an even number. Squaring a number and adding 
Six squared is 36 plus one is 37. Okay, so that you're saying you've given me a counterexample, so it must be false. Six squared plus one is 37. Give me another counterexample. And definitely not even numbers there. Good job. Easy as that. All right, below that, you could make up your own if you want to play that game at home. All right, flip over to the next section. We'll get this knocked out here. <coughs> All right, so we're going to combine some statements in here and compound statements. Uh, a statement is a sentence that is either true or false. Yeah, it is very much related. Why we're doing them on the same day? It makes sense. Uh, this is called its truth value. So each statement or sentence is going to have a truth value to it. We're going to represent those uh, using letters uh, like P and Q is what we'll use the most today. Is letters P and Q. So you have a statement P supplementary angles have a sum of 180 degrees. What is the truth value for that statement? Your supplementary angles have a sum of 180 degrees. Yes. So it's true. So it's truth value is true. Yeah, this, this is the P is all you need there. All right? <clears throat> when we have statements, we can do things to those. And the negation of a statement has the opposite truth value and the symbol that we use for the negation of a statement is this little squiggly hyphen and you read that not and then the, the letter of the statement's name which is not p uh, for example there underneath that not p is taking the negation of that that first statement. The, the original statement was that supplementary angles have a sum of 180 degrees. The negation of that statement is that supplementary angles do not have a sum of 180 degrees, which the truth value for that would be false, right? Because we know that supplementary angles do have a sum of 180 degrees. So the, neg the negation puts a not into the statement. If the original statement had not in it to begin with, it takes it out. Okay. So negation either puts a not in or takes it out, depending on what it, the original had. Okay. Compound statements. What are compound statements in English class? Connected by a conjunction, what conjunctions normally connect to us? And? Two or more statements. Joined by and or. A conjunction, statements joined by the word and, is written with this symbol. Little I'll stop. Okay. So when you see that, you're reading P and Q. That's what that reads. <clears throat> then, <clears throat> it is its truth value when you have a compound or conjunction statement. Uh, is true when both statements are true. So a conjunction with the word and in it, both statements have to be true for that conjunction to be true. Got to be P is true, Q is true. If they're joined by and, if both of them are true, then the, the and statement is true. If one of them is false, 
then the and statement is not true, it's false. Okay, so and statement, uh, both have to have the same value, or both have to be true to be the whole thing being true. A disjunction is the word or, and you flip the house top upside down, like a V shape there. Notation for that. It's written, it's written as P or Q is how you read that. So the notation here. And it is the truth value of that disjunction is true when at least one. statements true or only takes one of them being true for the whole statement to be true okay and both of them have to be true for the whole statement to be true or's only one of them and it doesn't matter which one first or last okay so let's take these ideas and do a little bit of work here all right so we're given these statements P, Q, and R, and we're going to write compound statements and then determine their truth value. So uh, statement P is there are seven days in a week. Statement Q is March has 30 days. Statement R said Halloween is on October 31st. So before we start, let's get the truth value of each statement. P. Seven days in a week? Definitely. I think there's about 13 this week. Even though it was a four-day week. It's still. All right. Q. March has 30 days. False. How many days are in March? 31. R. Halloween is on October 31st. It has truth value of true. Okay. So we know the truth value of the original statement. Number one, ask us to write out the statement, the conjunction, P and Q. That's what that asks for. All right, so that writing that out is there are seven days in a week. And March, capital N. as 30 days. The truth value of that conjunction, it's an and, is what? Not true, Not true it's false. To be true as, with an and problem, you got to have double true. That doesn't work. Number two says Q or R. So March has 30 days. Or Halloween is on the symbol. Oh, that's it. And sorry, I was getting in the head of myself. And sorry, October thirty first. Sorry, my brain flipped that symbol over. It's good. Good to know. All right. So March has thirty days and. Halloween has 31, oh, is on October 31st. So, false because why? Yeah, it only has one of them. And to be true, it has to have both. So, this one would be a false truth value. Number three, P and R. I'm just going to write and there. Uh, we know how to write the statement out, right? And then what's the truth value? This one would be true because both of those P and R are both true. So that works. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Now, number four, we are going to write out the statement on because it has uh, this little squiggly thing here. What's that mean? The negation of statement P. So the negation of statement P is there are not seven days in 
a week. The conjunction is an, or the joiner is an and, and our test 30 days. So the negation, it's the not in there because it wasn't there to begin with. Um, so we got a, the first statement, not P, its truth value is false. The truth value for Q is already false. False and false equals a truth value of false. No. To be true, they both have to be true in an and. All right, finally, number five, we get to swap over to an or statement. P or Q. Okay, so or, and we could write out the statements. No negation going on here. Um, there are seven days in a week, or Halloween is on October 31st. Its truth value would be true, because both of them are true, but the, what are the rules for or statements? Only one has to be true for the truth value of the statement uh, to be true. All right. Number six has got a negation in it, and it says March... does not have 30 days or and then all, R is Halloween is on October 1st all right so this the the whole statement is definitely true what about the negation of Q? Is it true or false? It's true now, right? The negation of true or negation of Q is true. That March does not have 30 days, it has 31. All right. Number seven, a double negation. Not P or not R. Okay, so there. Are not seven days in a week or Halloween is not on October thirty first. All right. It's its truth value. There are not seven days in a week has a false reading. And then Halloween is not on October 31st is also false. False or false equals false. Number eight. Not P or not Q. So not P, again, is the, there are seven days in a week. There are not seven days in a week. Or not Q is March does not. What's the truth value there? Why? Yeah, only one of them has to be true for that or statement to be true. Even though the first statement there is false, the second statement is true. And for an or, only one is all we need. You could practice your own if you wanted to do that. Make up your own statements. I think that's so. Uh... All right, let's look at those truth tables. <clears throat> Everybody loves these. Uh, truth tables. Uh, it's a convenient way of organizing truth values for statements, and uh, we're going to complete these using negations, conjunctions, and disjunctions. Okay, so a negation. All right. So on the left, you're getting the original statement. The first column is the original statement, and it, if it has a true value, the negation of it would have to have a. 
false value, right? If the original statement was false to begin with, the negation of it would be true. When we have a conjunction of two statements, then we have to take each case for both statements, all right? So we've got, what if statement P, the original one was true, and statement Q, the original was true? So that's double true, and then the third column is an and. So if it's both true, then the third column can have a true in it. If the first one's true and the second one's false, the and will be false. If the first one's false and the second one's true, it's going to be false. If both of them are false, false. It doesn't matter what the statements are, but you have to know their original truth value, either true or false, whatever your statements are. On a disjunction over here on the last one on the right, statement P could be true. If it's true and then statement Q is true, the or will be what? True. If statement P is true and statement Q is false, the or will be true because it only takes one. If statement P is false and statement Q is true, then the or will be true. The only time the or is false, if it's both false. All stems back to the original truth values of your statements. All right, so we're going to do several truth tables here. And when you're building truth tables, the ones that you're going to, you know, we're going to practice here, they've already built them for you or got the grid drawn out for you, and we're going to put the stuff in them. Uh, we want to include the original statements and their truth values. So a column for each of the original statements, and then a column for any negations that are required. So the truth values of the negations and then the column for the compound statements, uh, which are the ones that they ask for there. Okay. So let's look at number one there. We're going to do the truth table for P or not R. So we need to do a column for P, a column for R, then a column for not R. And then finally, the last column is going to be our statement that they ask for. Okay. What are the possible scenarios? If P was true, R could also be true. Let's go ahead and fill out that whole row. Then what would not R be? False. And then the last column asks for P or not R. So this is this first column and third column. True and false, an or becomes true. What if P were true and the original R was false? The not R would be true, and then the or would be true. And then we get to what if P were false and R were true. Not R would be false. So the or would be false. Because it's a not R in the or statement. And then the last scenario is that both of the original statements were false. That means the not R would be true then. So the or would be a true statement. Okay. All right, so this one, uh, number two, what are the columns that I need? Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and put the not P in the middle. It technically doesn't matter what order you put those original, those things in there. Uh, just because I think it makes it easier to read a little bit there. If you put the Q in the middle, it's actually fine. It's the same thing. And then the third column would be our AND statement. Not P or, I mean, AND Q. All right. 
P were true, not P would be false, and Q could be true. So not P being false and Q being true would equal us a false on the end. If P were true, not P false, and then Q were false. Be false, false, which is a false. And then we get in, okay, well, P is false now. Not P would be true. Q could be true. That's a true. False, true, false, false. All right. To number three. So we need a column for Q, not Q, and R. And then our final one, not Q or R. So we got scenarios for Q are true, not Q would be false. And then R could be true. So its OR statement would be, what would the first be true, right? If Q were true and not Q was false and R was false, the OR statement would be false. If Q were false, not Q is true, R is true. That'd be true, wouldn't it? And then if Q were false to begin with, not Q would be true, and then R has to be the other one which is false. True false would be true because it's an OR statement. All right. Number four is a double not with an AND. So I'm gonna need a column for P, a column for R, a column for not P, and not R. And I'm just putting them in that order because that makes it a little easier to just look at the, the last three columns to get my statement done. It's not, not <clears throat> right or wrong either way. Not P and not R. All right, so scenarios for P would be true, 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 false, false, true, false, false, right? Those are always the same. Those are never changed. They've been the same on every one of them. And then we go over here and do the nots. So not P would be false, not R would be false. Not P would be false, not R would be true. True, false, true, true. So the negation just changes each one of those. And then the AND statement, which one's the only row that's true in the AND column? The very last one, because it takes a double true. The rest of them are false. Easy stuff. Skip on down number six. That's got a lot of stuff in it. So they've already got the grid set up for you here to fill out. So we've got three original statements. We got P, Q, and R. And then we've got an AND statement on the inside that's in parentheses. So I'm going to put it first because think order of operations, parentheses, that's going to go first. So I'm going to do the Q. A and R, and then the last column is going to be the, the one they're asking for, so P or Q and R. All right. It's a little complicated here when you get more statements involved, so let's try to fill out just the first three columns uh, before we do anything else. So what's your uh, options for P? You could have true, right? What, if, what about Q? Could have true. What about R? 
true. So all three true. What if P were true and Q was true and R was false? So I'm just changing the R at that point. Then I have the option of P being true, Q being false, and R being back to being true. Then I have P being true, Q being false, and R being false. <coughs> All right. So, combinations here, I've got true with false, or true with true, true with false, true with true, true with false, and then the false false, both of them. True and false, true and true, false and true, false and false. It's complicated to get more, more statements in there. All right, so we've taken up all the possibilities of P being true. So now let's go to P being false, false, true, true. You could have false, true, false. False, false, true. And then the last line will be everybody's false to begin with. <coughs> All right. <coughs> now let's do that and statement. Just Q and R is the only two we're looking at there. So uh, Q and. So which ones are going to be true? Which rows? The first one. Q's, are, Q's true and R's true, which would be fifth one. That's the only ones that are true. And the rest of them have to be false because it's an and. And now we're looking for or. So we're looking at first column and fourth column. How many trues do there need to be for it to be true? One. So row one. Row two, row three, row four, row five. All true. False, 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 false. So three falses at the end there. So true, 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 false, false, false. Make your brain hurt a little bit if you crossed up a little bit sometimes. All right, let's look at number seven. A little bit bigger. Not Q and, and then parentheses, P and R. So we've got three original statements, P, Q, and R. And we have one negation statement, which is not Q. And then we have P and R. And then finally, the last So three statements originally. So we know there's going to be four possibilities of true for the original one and four possibilities of false. Could have all true. We could have true, true, false. We could have true, false, true, or true, false, false. We could have false, true, true, false, true, false. False, false, true, and then false, false, false. Those are the same three columns that we had in number six. And then we go up here to the next column, which is the not Q. So we just go to the Q column and go the opposite. How about it here? The and column, P and R. 
and R. So for it to be true, how many trues do there have to be in those two columns? Got to be two of <coughs> two trues. So P and R, that's true. And then the third one, and none of the rest of them, right? <coughs> now, the final statement, where is the true value? Third row, that's the only one. The rest are false. Realize these are coming from statements that you're going to get. It really doesn't matter what the statements say to begin with. Uh, their truth values are what we're dealing with here. It's a logical thing here, not necessarily uh, a knowledge type thing. It's just logic is, is what we're dealing with. And when we're dealing with proofs later on or next week, uh, the logic idea is what you want to go with there. You all want to try eight or... You, you think you're good? I think you got it? All right. That's not a hard thing. Uh, I did plug you in. So...